BF21 is sponsored by the Climate Council of Greater Kansas City and KKFI 90.1 FM, Kansas City Community Radio. This is So Sustainability. Please welcome your host, Eileen Bobowski. Good afternoon, Earth Festival fans. We're happy to have you here this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited to share some information with you about So Sustainability. My name is Eileen Bobowski. I'm the executive director with an organization here in Kansas City called The Sewing Labs. And we teach sewing for employment, entrepreneurship, and enrichment. And I'm going to share some things with you today about our organization. So the Sewing Labs, we like to create, inspire, and thrive. Sustainability, again, with me, the executive director. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about sewing. I thought this was an interesting little uh, tidbit I came across. These are actually um, needles that are made out of buffalo bones that are over 30,000 years old. Sewing has been around for a really, really long time. We've obviously got to keep ourselves warm. And so someone was uh, smart enough to come up with this invention. <laughs> it's also in nature. Um, this is an image of a tailor bird that actually finds fibers in nature and takes the leaves and sews together with his beak the um, leaves of his nest for their young. Um, there's some cool video if you ever want to check it out on YouTube of a tailor bird. For some people, sewing is everything. This is a National Geographic cover from the um, 1980s of a gentleman who suffered um, uh, after a tsunami in New Delhi. And what was the one thing that he grabbed? The most important thing for him ended up being his sewing machine. And uh, this one had obviously um, received quite a bit of damage. Um, interestingly enough, I did learn that the FAF sewing machine company um, ended up re-gifting him with a, a brand new treadle machine so he could continue to sew. I thought that was a wonderful story. We, we love that image here at the Sewing Labs. It's also a part of our history. Um, this is an image of Jane Austen, uh, who um, I believe wrote Pride and Prejudice. But she had two brothers that were often out to sea. And so that's an image of her with her little mending bag. And she would mend and sew their shirts while they were out to sea. And then when they'd come back in, she'd swap out and, and do the same thing again. It's also part of the westward movement um, history of the United States and the wagon trains that, that moved west. Sewing was the thing that, that kept the women together and built communities. There were sewing circles and sewing bees. And one of the most prominent things that they sewed, of course, is the family heirloom quilt. When I was doing some research about the westward movement and quilting, I did come across some interesting information that, um, the people on the westward movement didn't stop and mill lumber if someone got ill and passed away they would actually wrap their loved ones in the family heirloom quilts and so there are people buried along the wagon train uh, trails across the united states that um, were interred in the family heirloom quilt I thought it was interesting and in the late 1800s the singer sewing machine company came along interestingly enough um, they are getting ready to celebrate their 170th anniversary this year. Um, there's not many companies you can think about in the United States anyway that have been around and are still around 170 years later. Um, they're actually coming out with um, a machine similar to this that's brand new, that's a hand crank machine in honor of their 170th. So it's pretty cool. Sewing has essentially become a lost art. Um, this is a very familiar image to me. This is how, how one of the ways that I learned how to sew beyond my family. They used to have classes in junior high school and high school. They were required um, classes that you learned how to sew. It was an essential life skill. And consumerism has helped to contribute to the disappearance of sewing. 
Back in the 1960s, the average person had 25 pieces of clothing, max, that they would rotate through and clean. And they were fine pieces of clothing. And today, many people's closet looks like this or like this, just jam packed with clothing. Um, and that's because the manufacturers are just feeding this to us at such a, a fast frenzied pace. And the sewing labs likes to work to reduce that. We're big fans of slow fashion and sustainability here at the sewing labs. Sewing in high schools where the story of the sewing labs actually begins. Uh, these two women in the mid 2000s lost everything, homes, businesses. Um, the woman in red, Kelly, will tell you she was getting ready to move into a shelter with her two daughters. And instead, it used to be a trend back when we were all growing up that you got a sewing machine as a graduation gift for high school. And so these two ladies dug out their high school sewing machines and became entrepreneurs and started sewing pillows for a, a soft goods furnishing company here in Kansas City. And they came back to them and told these women, can you sew 200 pillows a week? And they're like, sure. And they're just in their basement sewing. About the same time, there was a program at another nonprofit here in town that was starting a uh, program called 100 Jobs for 100 Women. And Kelly was at a function with that other nonprofit. And they said, who will hire a woman? And she said, I will. We have 200 pillows a week I need to make. And so they focused on um, hiring people who were dealing with generational poverty, substance abuse and recovery, uh, formerly incarcerated, uh, immigrants, veterans, and put these people back to work um, through sewing. And they uh, essentially built a very successful soft goods furnishing company here in Kansas City called We've Got You Covered. And they manufacture, they still manufacture pillows, but they do draperies and bedding and cushion coverings and they um, outfit office, uh, you name it. If it involves uh, interiors and sewing, it happens. They're also featured in the HGTV show, Bargain Mansions with Tamara Day. You'll see um, Kelly creating a lot of the um, pillows and bedding and drapery that's in that uh, TV show. They also brought in a third person, Linsa Stevens, who's our operations manager. And she had over 40 years of retail sewing experience. And she has helped to build the curriculum that we use in the sewing labs today. These three women essentially birthed the sewing labs. One of the um, biggest challenges that they had at We've Got You Covered um, was remnants, lots and lots of remnants. And they realized that they did not want these remnants to go into um, the landfills. And so what can we do with these remnants um, to help people learn how to sew and keep that material out of the landfill? And I said, well, we really should be teaching people how to sew um, beyond we've got you covered. And so they formed the Sewing Labs. And today our mission is we're an inclusive and welcoming community teaching the legacy of sewing for employment, entrepreneurship, and enrichment. And we're huge fans and proponents of slow fashion and sustainability. Um, sustainability and slow fashion has actually been around for a long time. I love this example of upcycling. This is an image of Vivian Lee in the outfit. Uh, and the storyline goes is she had to go visit Rhett Butler in prison and ask him for money. And she couldn't go in there dressed in her rags. So she tore the curtains down off the wall and made this outfit supposedly and upcycled it so that she could go and visit and look quite lovely at the same time. And I guess that became a trend in Hollywood because then Julie Andrews did the very same thing and tore the curtains off the wall um, to make play clothes for the children um, that she was now in charge of. And how cute is that? Talk about upcycling. I, I would that'd be amazing to have that dress and lo and behold, it's upcycled from curtains, who knew? One of the workshops that we teach here at the Sewing Labs is called Boro Stitching. Um, it's a Japanese ancient method of taking um, different pieces of fabric and artfully, mindfully, spiritually mending a design pattern into them to be able to use these as patches. Boro actually means tatters. And so we've held workshops here at the Sewing Labs um, on Boro Stitching. Here's some more images of that. 
We've also held workshops on um, shibori dyeing, another ancient Japanese method of dyeing. Um, similar to when I grew up, we used rubber bands and we did tie dyeing. Well, this uses thread um, to tie dye fabric and typically with using indigo dyes. This is a lovely dress. I just thought so cute. This is a shibori dyed dress. Um, love the pattern. <clears throat> There's a lot of things in nature that can be used for dyeing fabric. For example, the wood from a hedge apple tree can be boiled down and it ends up making fabric in these beautiful colors, really subtle, gorgeous. These are some pieces of silk um, that were dyed using hedge apple wood. Avocado pits is another amazing thing. Like who knew? We had one woman who came into the sewing labs and she said, I just spent the day going around to all the Chipotle's asking them for their avocado pits. And I boiled up 96 of them. And this is the color of uh, fabric that she was able to achieve by boiling avocado pits. It's all around us in nature. And Chipotle was gonna throw those away. You can use coffee beans to dye fabric. You can use tea to dye fabric. You can use spices, turmeric, to dye fabric. Imagine the beautiful colors you'd get out of this. Beets, of course. I know whenever I have beets in my salad, I typically tend to stain my clothes with that beautiful beet color. Red cabbage is another one you can uh, dye fabric with. Eucalyptus leaves. Look at that gorgeous color fabric from those eucalyptus leaves. Another one of the workshops that we teach here at the Sewing Labs um, that's kind of along those lines of sustainability is um, we've had workshops where people gather together and they're sewing feminine care products that um, we've given out to the homeless community or the indigenous populations. Um, we've got one coming up soon on, uh, we call it the Powerful Purse Workshop. It's actually being taught by a guest instructor, Chris McMillan. And these purses will go to, I believe, Ethiopia. Um, and they're for young girls so that they have something to carry their feminine care with them um, when they go to school. And it keeps them in school actually because they have something discreet um, to be able to carry that, those items with. And we'll be doing a workshop coming up next month on that. So that's another sustainable project. Another one that we've done, um, we're actually gonna do a Facebook Live this week on what we call unpaper towels. Um, you actually take uh, terry cloth and 100% cotton fabric and you snap them uh, together with grommets and then you end up putting them on a roll and you use them like paper towels in your kitchen. Um, this one's a pretty popular little workshop that we've done. Love this artwork that was created uh, by, is very small. I love how she takes the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, but instead switches it out for sustainability, making by the least expense or the least amount of effort that you put into things, making, thrifting, swapping, borrowing, using what you have. We love that. Some of the books that I love that are about sustainability and um, one in particular is called Mending Matters by Katrina Rodebau. She takes a very spiritual, mindful approach to um, stitching blue jeans and denim, um, a very artful approach. Uh, I know that the trend is kind of to be wearing the, the ripped jeans, but how cool do these jeans look that she's got piled up here? It's a beautiful book about slow fashion. I love the line she's got, a slow fashion guide for a well-loved wardrobe. Another great book I recently read called The Conscious Closet, which really takes that approach to what is in my closet? What can I get rid of? What can I do to mend things? Um, this is by Elizabeth Klein. Another eye-opening book is Fashionopolis uh, about the the price of fast fashion and, and the future of clothing talks about those big box stores that are selling those $5 t-shirts that are so uh, cheaply made overseas and they're, they're not meant to last. I mean, there's a lot of people that are saving up those t-shirts in hopes that they can upcycle them into a t-shirt quilt, um, which we've done workshops on that as well. So fast fashion is the inexpensive, cheaply made clothing 
that is rapidly produced um, by mass market retailers in response to the latest and most popular trends. Fast fashion is literally designed to fall apart and is a large contributor to the throwaway culture and overconsumption that we have in this world. That comes from uh, the Sustainable Fashion Forum. Slow fashion, on the other hand, is, is an awareness and an approach to fashion, which considers the processes and resources required to make clothing, particularly focusing on sustainability. Um, I, the way I approach uh, slow fashion personally for myself is I'm one person and I can make a difference in my world one person at a time, I think. And so for me, for example, I shop thrift. Everything I'm wearing today came from, from a thrift store with the exception of my shoes. So um, I try and do that. In a 2020 study uh, in the waterways around New Zealand, they found that 88% of the microparticles that were in the waterways came from clothing. Um, microparticles come from those um, polyester fabrics um, that really started taking over the world in the late 1960s. Think about the leisure suit. 60% of synthetic fabrics are made of fossil fuels, and 85% of that material is going to end up in landfills where it will not decay or decompose. Fast fashion is the number, so, number two source of pollution in our world. I, I ask people like I do, you know, consider sustainable fashion through thrift stores. A great one is Planet Aid. They are located um, here in the Kansas City region. They're also uh, in other states as well. They use, for example, large pieces of imper imperfect clothing that they cut to use and make baby clothes. Um, they have one group of people that are focused on damaged leather bags and they make shoes out of those. Um, and it's very common with Planet Aid to find seamstresses who work primarily with trashed clothing, either repairing it or making it entirely into new garments. The Sewing Labs actually has several stitchers uh, who work to repurpose their own clothing items and then they resell them, which we, we love that. There's some, some new websites popping up beyond Etsy now uh, for people who wish to do that, like Depop is one example I can think of. We got to stop this from happening. There's a lot of clothing in these piles of trash. A lot of times what happens, uh, look into the thrift stores that you're shopping at because many of the thrift stores um, while they'll put clothing out to purchase, they oftentimes will box this up and put it on shipping containers and send it back overseas. And then the people there are like, what do we do with this? Um, I did come across one company, uh, and I know there's many, but Bonded Logic, for example, they make a bat type insulation for homes made out of shredded denim. There's a lot of companies that now that are shredding fabric to be able to repurpose that fabric. We would love to have a fabric shredder here at the Sewing Labs. That'd be amazing. In a recent study, of um, sewing, almost 20% of the people polled said they did not know how to sew a button back onto a piece of clothing and instead would throw out an item of clothing rather than learn how to sew on a button. Love this image, just so beautiful. Those worn hands and that beautiful close up of that fabric looks maybe like a linen to me. Another company that we're big fans of here at the Sewing Labs is Loon & Co. Um, they're all about sustainability. And this is an image of a, a formerly loved quilt that's been upcycled into a really cool coat. You can check them out on their website, Loon & Co. We're another huge fan of Christian Michael. Um, he focuses on um, sustainable fashion, high-end um, fabric and clothing that is going to last how clothing used to be manufactured. I talked to a woman and she showed me a picture of her grandmother and then she had in her hand a coat and she's like this is my grandmother 80 years ago wearing this coat. It was well made. It lasts. We've got to get back into fashion that is well made. These are just some images of the sewing labs and different workshops. And we do a gratitude and grace quilt retreat every year that some of the images are from that. We accept fabric here at the sewing lab. So people can donate used fabric to us and we um, use this fabric in our programs for our students. So they don't have to go out and buy fabric. Uh, they can tap into all the shelves of used fabric that people donate to us. 
We also accept notions. We accept gently loved sewing machines. We love to honor the people who donate these machines and learn a little bit about them. I believe this one uh, gentleman came to us and he said his mother had sewn christening gowns on here and sewn wedding dresses on this machine. We're keeping these machines out of the landfill. Just scares me when I think about all of the home ec classes from all of the schools all over the country. Where are those sewing machines today? Unfortunately, I bet there a lot of them are in a landfill. So community is built with the sewing labs and that's really the heart of what we are and, and who we are is community. And um, we do that through we, our annual gratitude and grace quilt retreat. That's typically the third week in July. We've done um, maker fair at Union Station. We've held kid, kids camps in the summertime. Um, these kids sewed uh, book bags and drawstring backpacks. Uh, and book covers. We took the um, quilt patches from Maker Fair that children came and sewed, and we we put them all together and made a beautiful quilt that's here at the sewing labs. We also hold something uh, called Fabric Grab. Um, we do that twice a year here in Kansas City, March and in September. It's typically the third weekend, and people can come in and um, get free fabric. Uh, or they can make a donation for fabric. This last one, we had over 4,000 pounds of fabric that was diverted from a landfill by giving it away to people. Uh, love this image of somebody upcycling some fabric. Most recently, um, our community of stitchers, at-home stitchers, um, the pandemic, we learned really how important sewing is to our world. Um, a year ago, when nobody had masks, we took fabric from the sewing labs and we put together kits with 100% cotton fabric, some interfacing, elastic, nose wires, and we had volunteers who came via curbside and picked up kits to be able to sew 12 masks at home. And some people would get one kit, some people would get 10 kits and they would turn around and bring these masks back to the sewing labs and then we distributed them to the community at no charge. So uh, to date, I think we're at 71,000 masks. These went to hospitals, hospices, daycares, um, you name it. We also now are working on a community bag. These are canvas tote bags that are printed with the resources people need if they're homeless. We've got um, volunteer stitchers who are sewing these as well. They're filled with the toiletries and things that people need. Uh, we're also gearing up for a conference called Make It Her Story where we're gonna feature um, people who make and inspire people um, by people who are, uh, have made their life or made their living through their creative muse. That's coming up in May. I love this. A soul can be fed with a needle and a thread and our world can be um, better one stitch at a time is how we approach it here. Here's just some information if you want to check out the sewing labs a little bit more and learn about what we're doing. I appreciate you taking a listen and I will answer questions now if anybody has one. I think one popped up here. Does the fashion industry have an impact on climate? Absolutely. I don't have the facts about what their greenhouse gas emissions are at the moment, but that's certainly something I'd be um, worth looking into and, and try and help you find an answer for that. Any other questions, thoughts? Thank you for participating with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, organic fabrics, we think are best to use. We prefer 100% cotton. We try and avoid the um, polyester fabrics uh, as much as we can at the sewing labs. Um, those ones I think um, are not as good for our planet because as I said, they end up um, going into um, the waterways in our world. Um, very, very, very frustrating. Gosh darn leisure suits, whoever invented that. <laughs> Did not help, but 100% cotton fabrics, you bet. I 
thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, the Sewing Labs is located in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we're in the Columbus Park neighborhood. We're inside the old Don Bosco Community Center. It's a historic building in the neighborhood. It was built in the late 1940s or late 1930s. The bricks for this building were actually um, donated by J.E. Dunn, the J.E. Dunn. Uh, and they were built by the Italian, the building was built by the Italian immigrants in this neighborhood. And um, it's a, an amazing neighborhood. Um, uh, just amazing, different cultures from all over the world. We actually teach a course called Sewing as a Universal Language to immigrants from around the world um, who are uh, currently in English as a second language courses. Um, so we'll have a room full of students who don't speak English, but they're learning how to sew together and they're learning about sewing in, in the different cultures of the world. We do accept um, donations of patterns, of notions, of sewing machines. With the sewing machines that are um, donated to us, what we like to do is to gift them back out to students who complete our program so that they can continue to hone their craft from home. So we, we upcycle sewing machines as well. We actually have some wonderful volunteers who look over those machines before they go back out the door and make sure that they're cleaned and oiled and ready to go and in good working order. I think our students really appreciate that. Great questions. Sarah Shell would like to know if you accept donations of patterns. We do indeed accept donations of patterns. Um, we, we actually have an old pattern cabinet that we use to store our patterns in. And then our students are able to tap into those patterns as they choose to make garments or whatever those patterns might, might be for. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I've got one of my favorite in sewing, sewing instruction books behind me actually here. It's called the Reader's Digest Complete Guide to Sewing. Um, we actually have a library of, of sewing books that we have here that we repurpose and upcycle. People donate those, those to us and then we loan them out to the community um, for anyone that's interested in learning how to sew. Another great question. I'm curious for the people that are on, how many people actually know how to sew? <laughs> Should ask a poll, I guess, just curious, like. You can ask people to raise their hand if they know how to sew. There you go. I know how to sew. Anybody else know how to sew? Raise your hand, please, if you know how to sew or if someone in your legacy sewed. Um, that's how I actually started learning was my mother taught me to sew and I now have taught my daughter um, to sew just because I think it's such an essential life skill. Looks like about half of our attendees know how to sew. Love it. Been sewing since age 10. Yeah, we actually um, are gonna be doing some more on uh, 
we're kind of about all the fiber arts. Um, I think someone is actually going to be teaching a course on felting soon. Um, we have uh, people that we've been talking to lately about teaching knitting and crocheting. We don't accept yarn at this point, but I think we will in the future, um, just because it's so important to keep that out of the landfills as well. Um, so it's in our it's in our future if it's not on our curriculum at the moment. Sewing inventions. Oh, that's a really great question. You know, the, I think the greatest invention was the sewing machine um, that that uh, was developed in the mid to late 1800s. Um, and the company that really was instrumental in doing that is partnered with us, the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Um, they loved what we were doing to teach people about garments, and they loved what we were doing to teach people about um, sustainability when it comes to fashion and slowing fashion down. And um, they're actually going to feature the unpaper towel workshop that we're doing this week uh, coming up. And so um, I think that's probably one of the greatest inventions in the world, actually, was the sewing machine. Um, think about it. If you stand in your room and look around your house, not only the clothes that you're wearing, but other things in your home all require stitching. And the beautiful thing about that is, is there's very little automation when it comes to sewing as well. Um, so if you go into different factories and things, it still requires a person at a machine. We toured um, a mattress company, for example, and there's very little automation. A lot of the automation can't handle the flexibility of certain fabrics or um, the ease at which it needs to be guided with a sewing machine. And so there's very little automation. It's kind of a recession proof job, if you will. And so that's part of the reason why we're teaching people to sew towards employment because so many things in our world require that sewing and it requires a person to do that. Um, somebody started sewing at nine years old for her sister's Barbie dolls. My mother sewed our Barbie dresses as well. And I, I still have the patterns. Um, what do I think has been the most useful stitch or skill in making clothes? Hmm, I don't know that I have the answer to that. That's one I think I have to think about a little bit. Um, I, I think sergers are really important to how our clothes are put together. Um, it's a very different uh, machine that's used to sew with, and it, it um, achieves a very different purpose. Uh, and actually the workshop that we're doing with the unpaper towels um, on Wednesday, we'll be using a serger because of the unique way you have to finish that unpaper towel. Um, I'll have to think about that one a little bit more. <laughs> and while we don't teach knitting and crocheting yet, we actually are in some very, um, we're in talks to uh, there is tailors of, around Kansas City, but we're actually talking to someone about teaching alterations. I can't tell you how many, how many times we are approached on a weekly basis um, for someone looking for alterations. There's fewer and fewer alterers uh, around, and we think that that's a very viable skill that we can teach here um, and encourage someone to become an entrepreneur and um, start tailoring for people. Uh, we think that would be amazing because it's kind of a lost art. In fact, I recently read a, a great article about Italian tailors over in Italy are starting to age out. They're getting up into their 80s and 90s, and there are not as many apprentices in Italy as there once were for a tailor. And so those tailors are now coming to the United States to try and find tailors apprentices. And we've been talking about an apprenticeship program uh, with the sewing labs as well, so that there's people that are looking for stitchers, and if they took them on as an apprentice, we have the opportunity to train, because we have industrial equipment in the room as well. We've got an embroidery machine, we're holding out hope for a long arm quilting machine as well, um, so. <laughs> I'd love to do my own alterations. We're hoping we can get some instructors in the room to start teaching alterations. 